Wait for it. Wait for it. Venezuelan involvement. What am I talking about? Well, first off, remember, we're looking at foreign policy issues, and here we're in our hemisphere. So Venezuela, which is located in the northern part of South America, is also right next to British Guiana. They have perpetual debt problems. Not just Venezuela, but a lot of the Latin American countries that keep borrowing money and then can't pay it back. This gives Europe an excuse for involvement. And remember, this is the age of European um, imperialism, Africa. So this is wide open. Now, 1902, Britain and Germany blockade ports of Venezuela. Uh, insisting they get paid. They will not leave until they do so. Roosevelt's response after attempts of arbitration were blocked by Venezuela was, quote, if any Southern American country misbehaves towards any European country, let the European country spank it. So this showing that really only when U.S. interests are involved did we care. Finally, will be resolved by arbitration. Britain wants U.S. Britain will agree to arbitration because they want to court uh, U.S. favor. Remember, the, against the rising Germany and negative public opinion stemming from German sinking of ships and bombarding of towns. So Germany was a little hardcore on Venezuela. So with those uh, factors, arbitration is agreed to. And remember, arbitration versus mediation. Arbitration is, once you agree to it, whatever the judge comes up with is what you have to go by. It's like a baseball umpire. You can argue all you want, but the call is going to stay the call. So here, we, what is the difference of this incident and that evoking of the Roosevelt Corollary? U.S. interests. So the, here's a biggie. We take the Monroe Doctrine and we're going to add to it. So our primary number one foreign policy statement is now going to have an addendum. A corollary, if you will. <laughs> so the Roosevelt Corollary. You can see I love this. this is, you got little old Columbia. Now what would you call this? It's not a cannon. It would be Teddy's Big Stick. U.S. Navy right here. So the Roosevelt Corollary, take a look, here's the notes, you can figure out the notes for yourself. Please look at them, pause me, I don't want to talk about them. So wherever the Western Hemisphere was peace is threatened, now the U.S. interests were involved. So, oh, if peace is threatened, we can get involved. So we're going to have a little preventative medicine, or preventive intervention. In 1906... United States will send troops and debt problems raise the possibility of foreign intervention. Under the terms of the Platt Amendment, the U.S. had the right to intervene in internal affairs of Cuba. So Roosevelt takes over the customs houses, prevents unrest because the spoils of government are gone. U.S. had a right to intervene because of the Platt Amendment. Roosevelt takes over the customs houses. That's where the money comes in and out. So if you have a corrupt dictator, if you wanted to stop them, you stop where their tax money is coming from. That's, that's what they're feeding off of. And the tax money was coming off of tariffs at the customs houses. These are the, where, at the ports where taxes are collected. So that's what he takes over. So if debts are have to be paid, he's got direct control of the money. So let's take a look at the highlights of the Roosevelt Corollary. I hope I have this up. There we go. Now, some consider this an excuse for continued imperialism. It probably was not. Now, love this quote. Some said the Monroe Doctrine had changed to 
You mind your business, and we'll mind yours. <laughs> Number 20! Some said the Monroe Dodger change suit. You mind your business, and we'll mind yours. Give SFI and explain how it supports or refutes the critics' claim in your study guide that accompanies the PowerPoint on the Google Classroom. Now, us getting involved in all these countries, did that get people upset? Nah. Frankly, seen as semi-good, like we're protecting them, we're taking care of them. We're their big brother. More like a, we're their daddy. Alaskan boundary dispute. Now, why would they be disputing the border in Alaska? What, you get that iceberg and I get this one? Gold. So, we're, the Klond you've heard of Klondike Bar. Well, Klondike Bar is from the area up in that Alaskan region called Klondike. Huge gold strikes, both in Canada and in America, Alaska. Now, needed an outlet to, outlet to the sea. Led to a reinterpretation of the Anglo-Russian Treaty of 19, 1825. It... Uh, to place the headwaters of many rivers under Canadian control. That means all the outlets through the rivers from the Klondike were under Canadian control. It is submitted to an arbitration panel of three Americans, three Canadians, and one British. Roosevelt writes a bullying letter indicating that if arbitration panel fails to decide in the U.S. favor, he would send troops and run the line wherever he wanted. The British diplomat Alverson is in a difficult position. Failure to support American claim could result in war. Ultimately, British desire to foster American friendship, remember Germany, has them decide on our side. Thus, we have entranceway to a seaport to unload the gold from the Klondike. Another foreign policy thing happening under the 10 years. Morocco. Yeah, Morocco. I know you can't believe it. Morocco. But bone of contention for Germany, England, France. Notice I didn't say America. In 1905, the Kaiser pays a visit and makes a belligerent anti-French speech. War legitimately possible between those powers. In 1906, they'll have a conference in Algeciras. Uh, I think, well, here's Morocco. I don't know where Algeciras is. Uh, Roosevelt sends strong word. Quote, You will notice that while I was most suave and pleasant with the emperor, yet when it became necessary at the end, I stood him on his head with great decision. Basically saying, yeah, I told him where it was. Oh, nicely, though. Seems to be a further extension of the Roosevelt Corollary. U.S. intervention might be necessary in Europe to prevent a war which ultimately involved the United States. So here we go. Teddy Roosevelt saying the United States should play the policeman of the world. Frankly, the birth of the modern American foreign policy. Now, it would quickly die during the 1920s after World War I, but certainly it's been alive ever since World War II. Eh, guy named Hitler kind of made it more relevant. Okay, Teddy's not done. Again, you keep seeing this in the thought. America gaining respect and prestige in um, uh, worldwide politics. Militarily wise, dip diplomatically wise. So if I had an essay showing how the United States became a world power, diplomatically, militarily, and economically, we are going over that essay right now, aren't we? What kind of 
documents would they give you? That'd be the next thing to ask. Okay, let's do the Russo Japanese War. I'll give you two guesses who's in that war. Number 21! Two and a one, two and a one. One and two, it's backwards on the screen. All right, you have an Ed puzzle to do. Teddy Roosevelt and the Portsmouth Agreement. So go ahead and read this about the Russo-Japanese War and why in the world do we care about that in American history? Okay, it's a war obviously between Japan and Russia. Each sought to extend their influence in China. They wanted larger spheres of influence. When the borders battled each other, voila, we got war. Russia retained troops in China following the Boxer Rebellion. And on February 1904, Japanese launched a surprise attack on Port Arthur, which is the southern port of Russia on the Pacific Ocean. Now, wow, look at this. A surprise attack. Hmm, I wonder what this portends. U.S. reaction praises Japan for its cleverness and cunning. Wow, that'll come back to bite us. All right, in this, U.S. public opinion favors Japan. What are the reasons? Well, let's take a look. One, commercial confrontation with Russia under the open door policy. Russia, frankly, is still medieval, man. They are still living under feudalism. Traditional favoring of the underdog. Come on, Americans like the underdog. Except Dallas Cowboy fans, and now you're the underdog. <laughs> and anti-Jewish pogroms. Frankly, they would just go on these giant killing sprees. Hey, you're a Jew! I don't get it, but this goes on through not only this time period, all the way through the 1940s, 50s, 60s. Thank you, Stalin. Japan surprises everyone with her repeated naval and land victory. Japan spanks Russia. Their technology is superior. And Russia, you know, they're run by a, a czar, a dictator. And he's not the smartest guy in the world either. So, frankly, the Russian military has shown up time and time again. Call for Roosevelt to negotiate a settlement. He accepts because of his desire to maintain the balance of power in the Far East. He doesn't want Japan to get too powerful. So thus he says, okay, I will, I will go ahead and agree to that. I'll arbitrate your war. He, now, the Treaty of Portsmouth basically splits the difference. And you've already watched the video. This is big prestige for Roosevelt, inflating his ego. Gets the Nobel Prize for Peace. Satisfied neither side, though, but that's what a compromise usually is. Russians refer to Teddy as a Jewish Rosenfeld. Tsar sees revolution, bloody Sunday. Whoops, excuse me. Uh, in Japan, his picture is turned face to the wall. They see Roosevelt favoring Russia. <laughs> he did favor Russia. In the terms of the agreement, man... Japan should have gotten everything. They crushed Russia. But due to anti-Asian, wanting balance of power, and frankly, this would also give Japan a little esteem. They go with it, but not happy about it. You know, turn the face to the wall, you, you, that tells you. Go ahead and read this to yourself. So we're not only looking at the prestige of Teddy Roosevelt and the United States' growing world power, we're also seeing the seeds of World War II, of J Japan, uh, surprise attack of Pearl Harbor. Where is this animosity coming from? Well, here's another place its animosity is coming from. Japanese immigration problems. 